Welcome, Natalie. It's really good to see you. Thank you for joining the Seekers Forum. I, I wanted to begin by talking about wild mind. Something that I've always appreciated so much in your work is your insistence on first thoughts, immediate experience, and not running away from the mess of our lives. In fact, the epigraph of Allen, and Allen Ginsberg says it all. He says, follow your inner moonlight, don't hide the madness. Can you say why that's so important to you in writing and in life? Well, that's where the energy is. <laughs> Can you imagine? Oh, I had a very nice time. It was very interesting. It was a lot of fun. <laughs> the real energy is with the agony, with being human and what it means, the suffering and how we really live. And also only when we face that can we transform it. Otherwise, it's just a sheen over everything and it's boring. It doesn't create good writing. Mm -hmm. And did Zen practice help you to learn to go there more directly? That's a good question. No, writing practice did. Zen sometimes, I was just into how much my body ached because we had to sit for 40 minutes all day, sit, walk, sit, walk. Um, it got me connected to my body, but writing practice, keeping my hand moving and accepting my mind at any level is what cracked it open. Mm. But the combination of them allowed me to study my mind, which is the real tool of writing, pen, paper, and the human mind. Where do thoughts come from? Memories, ideas, all from the mind. You have to know how to work with it. Mm -hmm. So the presence that you cultivate in practice does help with the writing as well. Yeah, yeah. You want me to say that? No, yeah. no, 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 no. I, that's my. In fact, that's in fact that's my experience. Is that one pointed attention? However, you want to you know, look at it. Absolutely helps me as a writer, uh, and and I feel like my observation, my ability to observe my mind in writing, helps me. When I, in, in, in practice as well? Well, I would say that the sitting taught me about monkey mind and taught me about discursive thinking, yada, 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 yada. And I knew that I had to get below that to really connect with writing. Right. So do you think that it's more difficult today in this virtual reality world uh, just over, overloaded with information. Do you feel like it's more difficult to be original in the world? I don't know about original. I think it's really hard to become present. I mean, it really helps scatter the mind mm -hmm. and not to, concentration isn't something that's honored. One pointedness, staying with something. There's just, it really scatters us. And I know a lot about the mind and it does it to me too. And I hate computers <laughs> and yet I have to use them and it very much scatters me. And um, I find it very tough and I'm very concerned for my students and it's hard. Um, I don't let them use computers when they work with me. Mm because it scatters too much, it's too external. And stay with your physicality of a notebook, your arm and your hand, and a pen, something cheap that is mm. available to everyone, right? anywhere. And what about conformity? Do you feel like there's more pressure in the world now to compete, to conform, because we're so exposed to everyone else's lives so intimately. What effect does that have on our willingness uh, to be ourselves? You know, I think people are always looking for security is the deep truth. Mm. And a human being wants security and they conform. It might be more obvious now, but I think it's a deep truth and that's part of learning to be a writer and for me to write books, three simple lines to go my own direction. Mm -hmm. 
and stay in it. Mm. It's not easy. And it's harder now, I think. And you think it's harder because of technology? Yeah, I think it is harder. Yeah, there's so, you know, you've got to be connected to yourself and your life and how you feel and experience things. And people instead know how they experience the computer or the internet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right, right. You say it beautifully. Uh, you say anything we fully do is an alone journey. Yeah. And that's true, right? A, a, a practice of writing of love. You know, yeah. It's but, you know, you're not as willing to go alone because you've got all these activities and so many things to watch. You know, um, what is it? Netflix, this, that, da, 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 da. You don't even go shopping. You just do everything online. At least when you go shopping, you feel the material. Mm. You meet the salesperson. You exchange physically money. You lick an envelope and put a stamp on. You know, it's very different now. And, you know, maybe a different kind of writing. I don't know. I only know what I know and what I've practiced for a long time. Right. And Do it's you... completely against what's going on now. <laughs> right. That's, that's what it seems to me. Do you think that there's another side of the pandemic and the forced withdrawal that's helping people focus on, you know, simplify, go inward and, and notice what really matters? Maybe, but we're isolated, so I don't know. <laughs> I know that people are very lonely, uh, but I do know that people are reading more. Yeah. Which I like, you know, which I like. So how do we shift loneliness to solitude? You know, that sense of barrenness to a feeling of fullness in our being alone. Well, it's an acceptance. It's an acceptance of loneliness and that that certainly in Japanese culture, they accept it as the original state that we're all lonely. Mm -hmm. You know, that, you know, you die alone. Mm -hmm. And that's not sad. No, 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 no. No. So how do you make, how does one make that flip? How does you, how do you make that switch from, oh, that's so sad, a sort of Western way of I looking at it? I think you accept it. You just accept it. Mm -hmm. And your willingness to talk about it. Mm -hmm. I needed Zen because before Zen, in my Jewish culture, nobody wants to talk about loneliness. They wanted to all stay together all the time. Mm -hmm. And I was able to address it in my Zen life. Mm -hmm. And I certainly had it, a lot of loneliness. Mm -hmm. But it can take you deeper. It doesn't need to be intimidating or... or uh... Just a, a, a state like anything else, like happiness, yeah. like sadness. Yeah, yeah. I'd like to uh, read a section from the book where you talk about Monet. It's so beautiful. Uh, and, and why it's important to be broken open. Okay, you're yeah. talking about my new book, right? Your new book, or we're going to get right to it. <laughs> the, but when you talk about being broken open, you say, he felt alone, shattered, and defeated. He would go to the pond and sit before the water lilies in despair. How to capture what was before him. Under his deft hand, the lilies broke open, filled with more light, became more abstract, the world no longer a solid place. And that is such a gorgeous passage. So how does attention break the world open in that way and reveal the light? Well, first of all, he had many years of practice. Monet, um, he was doing the water lilies abstract at the end of his life. So it's a lifetime of painting. And he was broken. It was World War I. He lost his wife died, who he was very, very close with. He lost his son. And he was alone in Giverny. And he went out every day to look at those water lilies. Mm -hmm. And I think by, as a practice, going out every day, really broken, he would look and they broke open. Mm -hmm. They weren't just water lilies, you know, tight. They had broken open into light. Mm -hmm. But, you know, so he had some moments 
of waking up. And then he probably went back and had dinner and was alone again. Mm. Mm. There's no solution. It's not a problem to be solved. No. Well, you can't solve it. You know, we're human and born in human bodies. And yet so much spiritual practice seems to be aimed at trying to solve it, fix it, make it better, uh, bring out the light and, and skip over a lot of the mess. Well, I think that's a misunderstanding of spirituality, but that might get you there to practice. Right. And then as you practice more deeply, it's more of an just being here and accepting it. I mean, mm. what do you do with all of this craziness? Mm. You think you're going to control it or, I mean, it gets worse and worse. <laughs> I mean, I can't believe it, you know. It's true. When you just when you think it can't get any harder or crazier, oh, yeah. it gets crazier. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Have you seen, by the way, the, the video of Monet painting in Giverny? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I don't know if you know I'm a painter. So yeah. I really study or I love stories about painters. Mm. You know, I get inspired by them. Someone showed me last night, uh, uh, it was a uh, collection, it was Degas, it was Renoir, it was, um, it was Monet painting. I went to all their homes in France mm -hmm. and um, I've been to Giverny many times actually. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So uh, let's talk about vulnerability in the face of this harsh world. You say that if you're not afraid of the voices inside you, you won't fear the critics outside you. How do we cultivate that kind of self-reliance and self-trust? I do it by practice. And you know, when you say the word originality, I kind of go back because we always have this idea, how do you become original? Mm. What you really do is listen to who you are right. and say what you need to say. Right. And it's scary. It's very scary. And, you know, when I first started writing, because of my childhood that I was put down a lot, I thought they would all think I was an idiot. Instead, they said I was a genius. Mm -hmm. I thought, you're kidding. And then I kept saying things and like creeping a little ahead. But I promise you, if that you speak from your true self, somebody will respond. Mm -hmm. And if they put you down a lot, get out of that arena. Mm. You know, get in an arena where you can just speak with no response. Mm -hmm. Be with other writers and do writing practice where you write and read with no comment. Mm. So you get to learn to voice your voice. And it's amazing how much, if there's no comment, you can hear when you're on and when you're off, when mm. you're bullshitting and when you've really hit home. Right. Right. I was actually also thinking about you as a published author and how one deals with readers. You know, we write, but lots, lots of people want to be read as well. And so when you open the door <laughs> to all those, all those opinions, you know, keeping your one center can be a challenge and, and you've seemed yeah. to do it really well. Well, I protect myself. I don't listen to a lot of opinions. Mm, smart. That's smart. <laughs> yeah. I don't, I don't, I don't ever look at Amazon or any of that stuff. I don't even know how to. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't, you know, I, I don't know how. <laughs> You're smart. Okay, so let's talk about three simple lines. Okay. <laughs> you mentioned in an email to me that it's like nothing you've ever written before. Uh, and obviously every book is new, but how so? What, what, what does that mean for you? Well, I think because I'm not the main character. For me... I did a lot of research. I read at least 50 books and I didn't know 50 books about haiku and Japan and the old world of haiku, the original people. And um, also how to incorporate all that information. I wasn't the center of the universe in this book. And also I did a lot of research and um, I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't, and, and I worked on it for three years and I didn't dare say to myself or to anyone else 
that I didn't know what I was doing. I never talk about a book when I'm working on it. So for three years, I was alone with it and I would just dread working on it because I didn't know what I was doing. I would get this idea and I'd go all the way this way. Then I'd go all the way this way. Eventually the last month, I wove it all together. And that was the structure I created. But I didn't know anything till the very end. And is that is that a common experience for you to no, when you're no, I usually I'm not as lost. I have an incredible mojo that I'm still discovering. Because if you're not discovering, why write? It's fun mm -hmm. to discover. But um I, I have a mojo and I'm going someplace and I want to tell you and I'm alive. And this was, I was learning. And also, who was I to write about Japan? Mm. Jewish girl from Brooklyn. Mm. As a matter of fact, at one point, because, you know, I don't believe in that. You, I've, I've gone to Japan many times, but I don't believe in that. You know, what do I know about Japan? I know you have to live there for 40 years. But so what I did was I moved to Brooklyn and I got an Airbnb in Brooklyn as I wrote some of these chapters. Why? Because I felt that I was ashamed. I hadn't been to Brooklyn in like 40 years. And yet I, so I was turning my back on where I came from and I was writing about something else. So I felt I'm gonna plant myself in Brooklyn at least when I write about Japan. I'm honoring where I come from. Right. So that helped. And you know, Japan is so enigmatic, mm. you know, and, and so it took a lot of work to make it that simple and to hand over the information I did. Mm -hmm. And it is simple. I was saying before we began, there's there isn't an extra word in the book. It's very, it's it's very can it's very I don't not I hate economical, but it's minimalist. Well, in, it's like in a, a beautiful way. It's it is like, like it's like a haiku. Yeah, the whole thing is an experience of a haiku. Yeah. Let me ask you for people who haven't read the book and don't know yet, what is it about haiku that you love so much and that you feel is important to? to readers today and writers well, today? Well, I think because we're ignorant about haiku. And as a matter of fact, the first person who um, interviewed me had never heard of haiku. And um, I was so shocked, never heard of haiku and didn't know how to pronounce it. So um, I'm going to, if I can find it very quickly, I will actually read it to you because I think that it's very simple. I studied with Allen Ginsberg in 1976 at the Jack Kerouac School of Disembodied Poetics. And uh, that was in Boulder at Naropa. And one day he said this to us. Um, whoops, I should have had it more. Oh. He also told us that the formal five syllable, then seven, then five, often taught in Western schools does not necessarily work in English. In Japanese, each syllable counts. They don't have the, and that. Those articles of speech. So he encouraged us not to worry about the count if we write or translate haiku. Only make sure the three lines make the mind leap upon hearing one. Mm. The only real measure of a haiku, Alan told us that one hot July afternoon is upon hearing one, your mind experiences a small sensation of space. He paused, I leaned in breathless, which is nothing less than God. So of course, and when you, upon hearing it, it slows you down, it brings you home. So maybe I'll read just a few. So you'll that have that great. experience. You'll have that experience and um, you'll see what we're talking about. Oh, this is one of my favorites. This is the hype, 
this single haiku by Busan. I studied the four greats who practiced the way of haiku like someone else practices the way of Zen. Mm. Um, this single haiku, I made a vow that someday I would go to Japan and go to Busan's grave, mm -hmm. find it, and thank him for this haiku. It took me 19 years to get there. Well, I know it by heart. Ah, grief and sadness. The fishing line trembles in the autumn breeze. I'll say it again and watch your mind. Ah, grief and sadness. The fishing line trembles in the autumn breeze. Mm, mm, mm. So simple and mm. so present. The mm. fishing line. Mm. Mm. You don't have to have fancy things. Right. The there's fishing. always that and there's always an enigmatic quality to it the sort of a mystery space i think that's what he means by nothing less than god it's that oh, where the, yeah. it doesn't it doesn't make sense it, you can't the mind can't capture it rationally yes i think that that's true but it also you have to kind of first you don't what 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 and then ah mm -hmm. oh so there's a little space because you're oh oh, oh. This is um, Isa, which is one of the favorites of J the Japanese. He, his mother died when he was three. Mm -hmm. He wrote this first haiku when he was six years old. Mm. Come play with me, you little sparrow, motherless sparrow. Mm. Come play with me, you little sparrow motherless sparrow it's a magic that happened just the repetition why does that do that why does it create that well it's also so beautiful it's so beautiful it's and poignant. So simple and it's such a good thing for now because we're so worried and so upset and we're so out of control and this when i read haiku it brings me right back mm. and then if you practice haiku you have to notice and not notice something big like, uh, you know, uh, you know, a terrible storm or something small. Notice the snowflakes. Mm. Mm. Simply, I'm here. Simply, snow falls. That was mm. Isa. It stills. It stills the mind. It, it exactly. quiets the mind. Exactly. It's not so. Meditation isn't the only way. Mm -hmm. That's partially why I studied it. Mm. Listen to this one too. This is Isa. Sitting on her eggs, the chicken admires the peony. <laughs> I love that so much. <laughs> Sitting on her eggs, the chicken admires the peony. You're not even there. It's... So you're noticing the chicken and what the chicken notices. Oh, and Isa also, he had a very hard, even though he has some very funny poem, haiku, he had a very hard life. Mm. And his daughter died, his three children died, his mm. wife died, and he loved his daughter so much. Listen to this. In a dream, my daughter lifts a melon to her soft cheek. Mm. You know, mm. It, mm. you forget about your agony mm. and you're inside someone else's. Mm. And mm. yet he's able to express it. Mm. So it communicates from the 17th century. Mm. In a dream, my daughter lifts a melon to her soft cheek. Mm. Mm. Beautiful. Yeah. It's so beautiful. So another another one I love it is is in the darkness of the heart a firefly. Oh yeah, yeah. Who is that? Yeah, is, is I that grasp Busan? I grasp in the heart in the darkness of the heart a firefly. Is that Busan or is? I'm not sure. It's it's from your book. I didn't uh, oh, okay. I didn't write down the author. Oh, because usually now I've gotten to the point where I actually can tell the difference between who wrote it. 
even really? though it's only three lines, because I put in the biographies of these people, which right. became really interesting. Mm. So in a way, writing the book, the assignment was I learned all this stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. there's a, um, one of them, Shiki. Um, Shiki at 13 coughed up his first blood, oh, blood. He had TB and he died in his early thirties and he knew he was gonna die his whole life. And yet he not only kept writing haiku, but he, he, he really extended it and brought it out. And he had many, many disciples. And here, hold on, this is my writing desk. I have this on my desk. Uh, well, I'll tell you first. So his five last years, he was in such pain, he had to stay in bed. And every day he would drag himself to the edge of the tatami and would sit all day looking out at his garden, waiting for a haiku. Mm. And here is Shiki. If you can see him, mm. can you? Yes, can you see yes, him? yes. Wow. At the edge of his tatami. And um, so I found out extraordinary things, and yet they kept showing up. Mm -hmm. Just what you learn in Zen, show up. Mm -hmm. Just what you learn in writing, in whatever, show up. Right, right, right. So when you're writing haiku, you don't, you're not generating it from the mind. You're really waiting for a download. Well, I thought that's what you do. But in truth, you actually practice it like everything else. You actually keep practicing it. You can edit it. Oh, you Once can. in a while, they come to you. You know, it's like nothing. It's like everything else. Okay, you so it really is like them. poetry. I mean, yeah. it, really, it is like writing poetry. You might get a line, but then you work it. Yes, yeah. I practiced... Um, I, that's what I thought it was. It was like magic. It would just come to yeah, you. That's but you right, actually yeah. have to practice it and work on it mm -hmm. and work on it a lot. Mm. And um, yeah, I, I mean, mostly I'm happy reading it. I did join because I didn't know what the book was about. I also joined a haiku group, which I write about one of the chapters and you know, studied haiku with them and wrote them and brought them in each day, each week, no, each month. And they ripped them apart. <laughs> I mean, I was the worst. I was, the, but it, I delighted in that. You know, it's nice not to be so great. And you didn't have any pretense the, uh, otherwise. I mean, you, no, you knew you I, were I, a beginner. No, I just kept saying, just teach me, teach me. Mm -hmm. And they would call, pull me aside at the end and say, well, if you want to learn haiku, read a lot of them and write a lot of them. And I listen to it and I think, that's exactly what I tell my students. <laughs> right. <laughs> keep right, that's keep your hand moving. <laughs> yeah, it was no different. Right, right. You, you say that this is the third book in your cancer trilogy. Uh, you almost don't, you barely talk about cancer uh, in the book, but you say that you wrote it partly to say, you see cancer, you didn't get me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, like nobody who, who read this book would know it was my third book in a cancer trilogy. But when I came home in 2012 from Japan on a trip with Yupaya with Kaz Tanahashi and Joan Halifax, um, I started this book at you know just spontaneously. I'd gone to Busan's grave, and then soon after I got cancer, and so I left it behind. And while I had cancer, I wrote The Great Spring, which I love. And then when I found out I was going to survive, I wrote um, Let the Whole Thundering World Come Home about mm. having cancer at the same time as my partner had cancer. Mm -hmm. And um, then I was well enough. I thought, well, let me go look back at that, uh, you know, what I wrote hoping it wasn't good so I could forget about it. <laughs> and I read the, I had 25 pages. And I thought, oh, this really is good. I have to finish it. Oh, that's so I worked hard. on it. And then I felt like cancer. I mean, eventually something is going to get me. But cancer, you didn't get me then. I got to finish this book. Right. So I wrote three books in five years. 
wow. while I had cancer. Yeah. Yeah. I'm tired now. <laughs> <laughs> You're tired. <laughs> um, one last question. I just wanted to talk about, you, you talk about being in love with your life and you radiate this in your work. I mean, I fell in love with writing on the bones 30 years ago. I mean, it's, it's, it had, it has an energy to it, a power to it. That's palpable. How do you, how do you regenerate in a time like this when there's so much overwhelming uh, sadness and, and, and difficulty, how do you stay hopeful and connected and engaged? Um, well, it's all new for me now. You know, I could tell you in the old life, but the old life is over. So now, first of all, hopeful has never been something I believed in, mm. to be honest with you, mm. in the old life or this life. What I like is no hope. Mm. <laughs> no hope. Things as they are. Mm. So I'm not hopeful. And in this life, well, first of all, I was, I was crazy. Oh, I'll tell you, I'll tell you, I, um, in August, I completely, I was not Natalie. What I mean by not Natalie, I didn't exist. I became a 50s housewife. I didn't know who I was, what, I was completely gone. I, I had no idea, I, I couldn't write, I couldn't, I hmm. couldn't do anything. Hmm. And I was, I was very messed up. And friends even were scared for me. I just... I, I, I was no one. And I had... This, this, um, past, this past August. Yeah, this past August. And it was partially because I was home all the time. Mm -hmm. I was used to traveling a lot. I was used to connecting with people. Mm -hmm. I didn't know I was so, um, you know, social. You know, because <laughs> I usually like to spend a lot of time alone. But I missed human beings. I missed mm -hmm. going to a cafe. And even if I knew no one... There were other breathing human beings. Right. And I didn't realize how much that juiced me. I was just alone. I, I live in this beautiful house alone. And I do have a partner, but she doesn't live with me. I just was alone. And you couldn't go near anybody. Mm. So I had been asked, I had a, a residency in Port Towns in Washington. Mm. And I was going to cancel it because it's COVID and I wasn't going to go. And I'd have to drive and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And my girlfriend said to me, because I, this is how lost I was. She said, I'll drive you to Port Townsend. Wow. Wow. So, so I said, okay. And I, I, we went and we stopped at Salt Lake. And finally, I opened the map to look. And we were going to go along Idaho, southern Idaho. And I looked and I said, oh, huh. Ketchum, Idaho is near where we're going to be. It's out of the way. I, it's too out of the way, but I've always wanted to go to Ketchum, Idaho for like 35 years. And Baxim said, well, let's go. I said, really? You know, because it wasn't logical. I, right. you know, I was dead. I said, really? And she said, yeah, let's just go. We have enough time. But, there's no limit anymore. There's no right. structure. There's nothing. Nobody's waiting for you. Right? Yeah. So yeah. We, we drove to Ketchum. And do you know what's in Ketchum, Idaho? Hemingway. Yeah. Hemingway's grave. Right. And I visit graves. Um, let the whole thundering world come home. I write about all the different, I go to painters and writers' graves to see where they ended up and to thank them. Mm. Right, to honor mm -hmm. them. Mm. So um, we went to Ketchum, Idaho. When would I ever get to Idaho? And I, for 35 years, I wanted to go, but it never dawned on me to go. And um, we got to the hotel and about four o'clock and Maxime said, oh, let's go tomorrow. I'm too tired. I said, I'm going right now. Mm. I ran down to the front of the hotel and I said, where's the cemetery? And it turned out it was two blocks away. And I ran to it as the sun was setting. And it was a cemetery that doesn't ever close. It's a beautiful cemetery uh. with lots of pines. And I thought I'd know right away where Hemingway's grave was. I would just know. But I didn't. Luckily, I had my cell phone because I never carry it. 
And I called the man at the desk. I said, where is it? Where is it? <laughs> and he said, do you just look for two pine trees that are close enough together that only one grave can fit? I said, there are pine trees all over. And he said, look for the one where there's only, and then I said, I think I see it. And wow. I found it. I found it. And it was um, flat, the size of a rectangle, completely flat, the size of a man laying out six feet. And all it said on it is Ernest Miller Hemingway, 1899 to 1961 or two, I can't remember. Hmm. And he was 62 years old, you know, he shot himself. Yeah. And I sat down on the stump, a root stump of the one of the pine trees, and I poured my heart out to him. Mm. He was one of my deepest, earliest influences. Mm. I uh, traveled through Spain reading Death in the Afternoon about bullfighting, and I didn't care where I was. It brought me deeper into Spain than walking around Spain. Right. And um, and he wrote Movable Feast in Ketchum. Oh, I and, didn't know that. And I just, which is one of my favorite books. And I just poured my heart out to him. And of course, he's been dead for six, 1961 or two, you know, like 60 years. But so probably it's all vapor. But I felt that something, if any place it was there, Mm. And I just poured my heart out. Mm. And um, I, as I poured my heart out, I came back to myself. Mm. Mm. He was totally crazy at the end. He was very messed up, mm. but he wrote Movable Feast. Mm. Mm. So he was his own practitioner, great practitioner. And so it, I kind of came back to myself. Oh yeah, this is my path for this lifetime right. and it really brought me back wow and then the next day the next day i went to the bookstore and they recognized me there and they called the head of the library who um ran his house no one was mm. allowed in it and she contacted me and gave me a tour of the house wow which was very moving. Of course, he shot himself in the house. Mm. And um, I, and that was wonderful. And it was a great opportunity, but it was the grave mm -hmm. that was the most important to me. Mm. Mm. It brought you back to life. It brought it you- It brought me home again. So I think what I'm saying as an answer to you, it's not easy to keep coming back to yourself and being alive and remembering who you are and what you're about. And sometimes you have to go really twisted and zigzag to find yourself. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. really what good literature is about, actually. Yeah. And it's what good, it's what practice is about too. Yeah. You have to get completely lost. Yeah. If you're not getting lost, you're not there, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, that's a beautiful way to end the conversation, Natalie. Thank you so, so much for, for doing and this. It's really fun to talk to you. I feel really comfortable talking with you. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. <laughs>